Welcome everyone. So glad to have you come join us uh, for the latest installment of Office Hours with Dr. Kelly. I'm really excited about today's guest and presentation and obviously always excited to have uh, Dr. John Kelly here. Today we've got Mitch Same. I hope I'm not slaughtering your name. Uh, Samet is fine, yeah. Samet's even better. Um, <laughs> Yeah, because I shouldn't pretend to speak French at all. Um, but we're, we're so excited to have you today, Mitch. He's going to be giving us a presentation on creating and implementing effective suicide practices in schools. So just a quick agenda run through where we'll get through the introductions and all of that kind of business as fast as we possibly can so we can dive into the presentation. I've had more than a glimpse into the deck and, and seen what's coming your way. So we need to get to the meat of it. And then we'll have a, a, a lively discussion between John and Mitch. And then at the very end, uh, we've re reserved that last portion for question and answer. So one thing I would ask of each and every one of you is that as you have questions, um, please put them in the chat. The chat feature is at the bottom of the screen. Just write what the question is there and then we'll, we'll be sure to come back to them once uh, the presentation discussion portions of this webinar have concluded. So last but not least, uh, uh, if you haven't been with us before, I wanted just to tell you a little bit about who we are. Uh, we are Aluma, and we are dedicated to solving problems in the areas of special education and mental health. Obviously we work in K through 12 and have been doing so for almost 11 years. And uh, we're just excited to be a part of this community and, and working arm in arm with, with uh, people like these two distinguished guests we have today. Um, you know, figuring out how we can make mental health better, how we can make special education better, all of this. So anyway, if you like this webinar, uh, you wanna see more of this kind of stuff, let us know. But more than that, we encourage you to follow us on Twitter at Illumatherapy, and also please follow us on Facebook. So without any further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. John Kelly. This is Office Hours with Dr. John. And uh, thank you both gentlemen. I'll come back as this presentation concludes. Well, thank you, George. As always, appreciate your support and, and certainly the work uh, of Eluma. Um, I want to welcome you back to my office hours, office hours with Dr. John Kelly. Um, if you've been with us the past couple of weeks, you have seen some really dynamic conversations that we had with Dr. Charles Barrett, Dr. Byron McClure, um, and I'm very excited to, to welcome a good friend of mine in uh, uh, this evening. Uh, we have a whole series of conversations planned for the next few weeks. So uh, we certainly hope you'll certainly be joining us for those upcoming webinars. Uh, but, but as I just said, I, I am excited because I have a good friend of mine in, a fellow New Yorker, uh, Dr. Mitchell Samet, uh, joining us for today. Um, and and uh, Dr. Samet is a school psychologist by training, but I have to give him a little bit of a hard time because I'm going to call him a failed retiree or a failed retired school psychologist. You see, Dr. Sammy retired a few years back. I, I guess it was probably about two, three years ago, right, right, Mitch? Uh, actually, eight, eight years ago, believe eight, it or not. Uh, see that? I mean, it was eight years ago, which is absolutely incredible. But Dr. Samet has remained incredibly active over those years. He's probably more busy now than I think he, he was a, a, as a school psychologist. But what you really need to know about Dr. Samet is he is a tour de force when it comes to suicide, suicide awareness, suicide prevention, suicide policies. Uh, Dr. Samet has written several school-based guides. He has been involved with numerous organizations, uh, the Trevor Project, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. He truly is an expert within the field, particularly as it relates to school-based policy. So I'm really excited to have my good friend, Dr. Mitchell Samet with us this evening. Um, and I'm gonna let Mitch kind of talk about some of the big ideas of, in terms of, of creating and implementing uh, suicide practices and policies. And then we're gonna kind of dive into it in just a little bit. So let me turn it over to my good friend, Dr. Mitchell Samet. Thanks, John. And, and you're right, you know, I can't stay away from the schools, even though I retired from full-time school practice. I've been back in the schools as a school psychologist in elementary and middle schools. Uh, and, and I do, uh, even though I, I'm not a, a full-time school psychologist any, anymore, I still love school psychologists in our organization, uh, the New York Association of School Psychologists. So today we're gonna to be talking uh, about implementing effective practices in schools. 
Uh, and we'll start with some big pictures and then we'll dig in and talk about some how to as well. Uh, and why are we doing this? Well, first of all, uh, I know for me, uh, I was certainly affected by uh, some, some uh, suicide deaths. Robin Williams comes to mind. Uh, Anthony Bourdain was a kind of a hero of mine. And recent media coverage of some of those high profile deaths have certainly, uh, you know, really underscores how significant this is. And at this point, we know that suicide has grown to become one of the leading causes of, of, of death uh, in the US. It surpassed the death rate for motor vehicle accidents, for homicides, even for breast cancer. So um, it, it, you know, from the big picture point of view, it, 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 it's a major uh, health crisis. Uh, and in, uh, in New York State, where John and I are from, uh, there are close to uh, over 1,700 suicide deaths in the state, uh, you know, and, and so we need to be thinking about how we could, uh, how we could do better. Uh, now, we're going to focus today, because most of us are school-based educators, administrators, school clinical staff, like school psychologists, social workers, school counselors. Um, we're going to talk mostly about how it relates to students and how it relates to, to uh, suicide uh, effective practice in the schools. So, and, and I apologize for these sobering facts and maybe I should back up for a second and let's take a moment to recognize that we know that suicide is a difficult topic to begin with and it comes at a particularly difficult time uh, in, in, in what's going on in the world between uh, isolation uh, from COVID-19 pandemic and the fact that we're just getting back into uh, kind of uh, like some, you know, away from some of our hybrid world and also uh, war in Europe. So uh, suicide is a tough topic to begin with. And, it's, and we're talking today uh, at a time where it's particularly difficult. So let's recognize that. Um, so it is the second leading cause of death uh, for children and adolescents. So think from middle school, high school, college age kids. Uh, and I find these statistics kind of sobering for youth middle school, high school, college age kids, 18.8, almost 90% have reported uh, considering suicide within the past year. And that comes from the CDC from just this year, 2022, and from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, uh, the most recent data we have from them is in 2019. Uh, and amazingly enough, 8.9%, almost 9% of those surveyed uh, the general population have actually made a suicide attempt. So if we think about that, if we're sitting in a classroom with 30 students, the, the, more than one or two of them uh, might have made an attempt within the past year, and one out of five of them have probably had some suicidal thoughts. Um, and I want to think a little bit about some of the more recent trends as well. Um, now, since 2007, which is when uh, smartphones became prominent, social media became more prominent, suicide deaths have surpassed homicide deaths for young people. From 2007 to 2022, suicide has become twice as likely to occur among younger adolescents. So in that 10 to 14 year old group, uh, it's doubled uh, in that short amount of time. So in what, 15 years or so. Uh, and the trends are consistent across varied racial and ethnic groups. Uh, and um, even though, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, even though there are some groups uh, in our population that are even at greater risk. We'll talk about that when we start talking about uh, tier two. Oops. I'm not sure why Peter's there. All right, hold on. Hi. So, uh, before we get into this, what I want to say is that uh, proper um, suicide practice begins with good gatekeeper training. Uh, and one of the things that we do here in New York is we offer a workshop called Suicide Safety for School Staff, and it helps identify uh, some of the risk factors and warning signs uh, that your staff looks at. So I'm going to show this brief tape. Uh, it's with uh, John and my uh, close friend, Peter Faustino, and he does, he does a much better job than anyone I know in presenting these. So let's take about three minutes, four minutes to listen to Peter. Peter Faustino, we've just talked about a variety of risk factors for suicide. 
it's important to remember that although risk factors are common, all they tell us is that someone may be at risk for suicide. Just like risk factors for heart disease don't mean that someone will have a heart attack, suicide risk factors are simply indicators of potential risk but a percentage of your students with risk factors may start to exhibit what we call warning signs. These are the things that tell us to stop and pay immediate attention because a student may be at risk for engaging in suicidal behavior in the near future. The word facts provides a helpful acrostic for identifying the most commonly recognized warning signs. F stands for feelings, hopelessness, worthlessness, despair about the future, or excessive worry. We should be concerned about students who are exhibiting these types of feelings. A denotes actions. Actions include things like trying to get access to a gun or pills, behaving recklessly, or increasing alcohol or drug use. It can also include showing aggressive behavior that's inconsistent with the student's previous demeanor self-harming behaviors, or being involved in bullying actions. Something new that's been added to this category is looking online for ways to die. C indicates changes. This is a very important category because it means we're looking for changes from the student's previous attitude, moods, or behaviors, which have been noticeable for at least a couple of weeks. For example, students who were active may become withdrawn quit athletic teams, stop paying attention to personal appearance, daydream, or even fall asleep in the classroom. It would be impossible to list all of the potential behaviors that you might see. So simply concentrating on recognizing changes from previous behaviors is the real key to making assessments in this category. T represents the threats that some students make or hint at. These can be specific statements of intent like, I'm done with living, or I'm thinking of killing myself, or worrisome innuendos in writing or other class assignments. Threats may also be posted on social media sites. Whether specific or vague, threats tell us that the student is thinking about death or suicide, and that is what escalates our level of concern. S refers to situations that may serve as triggers for the suicide. These include getting into trouble at home, in school or with legal authorities, personal losses in relationships, opportunities, or even losses of less tangible things like self-esteem or hopes for the future. Life changes for which the students feel overwhelmed or unprepared, such as moving or the transition after high school graduation can also serve as triggers. The most worrisome time is between the occurrence of the triggering situation and its resolution in that period of uncertainty before the outcome is known. So what do you do if you observe several of these warning signs in one of your students? First of all, you don't have to be certain that suicide is part of the problem at all. If you notice warning signs, especially if you see something that fits into the threat seriously, you want to respond. Treat your concerns the same way you would deal with concerns about any student. What's got your attention are the changes in the student's academic engagement. Focus on specific things you've observed and not try to figure out what's causing them. And remember, while students can disagree with your feelings about them, they can't disagree when you've given them specific and observable examples for your worries. Organize your concerns so that you can talk with the student about them in a structured way. Follow this up with a warm handoff to your designated resource staff. What's a warm handoff? We'll tell you in a couple minutes. And we're lying. We're not going to tell you about the warm handoff today. That's part of a, a larger training that I do. Uh, and Peter was a little bit over anxious. He jumped in a slide or two before we expected him, but that, that's Peter. So let's, uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, needing a better pathway to care. So uh, think in terms of this, uh, typically our process, at least it was when I was a school psychologist, was if, if, a, if a student comes into your room and they talk about 
having suicidal thoughts, typically uh, the knee jerk reaction is to have a conversation with them and then pretty much almost immediately uh, send them up to a psychiatric ER, mobile crisis, something like that. But consider this, children and youth are by far the greatest largest number of, of, of those seen in the ER for self-harm. In New York State last year, there were 4,500 kids, teenagers, you know, youth, uh, that were seen in, in, psych, in, in ERs because of self-harm, but only one-third of them, about 1,500, actually went from the psychiatric ER to hospitalization. So what happens to those other two-thirds, those 3,000 kids uh, who aren't hospitalized? Well, what happens sometimes is those kids who finally disclose what's going on, ask for help, they go to the ER, uh, maybe they're seen briefly and then sent home. If things aren't feeling better in the next few days, that's a particularly difficult and dangerous time for kids. And uh, John, I don't know if you know this, but uh, one of the things that kind of got me into the suicide realm way back when I was a young school psychologist, many, many, many years ago, uh, was that um, maybe I was in my third year and we had a student who we did, we thought we did everything right. We did an intervention, we sent him to a good hospital. He saw a, a good psychiatrist. And then three days later, he took his own life. Uh, and and so we and and I remember that feeling saying there has to be a better way, uh, and that was really the kind of one of the things that really prompted me to get into this, this field, uh, because I wanted to figure out a better way. So that pathway of referral out to community mental health is not necessarily adequate. And I know I'm echoing John's words, but when I say this, clinicians in schools are almost ideally suited. Uh, schools and school-based clinics are, are really in a great position to be able to assess students and adolescents and provide interventions and even short-term therapeutic support. We'll talk a little bit about that. I know, uh, John, I'm preaching to the choir. It's something I hear you say all the time. Uh, and really, we're in an ideal position to do that. So one of the things that we uh, that we just talked about when we saw Peter's uh, you know, pre presentation was a uh, gatekeeper training. And one of the questions you have to ask is, is this something you're doing with your forward-facing school staff, your teachers, your teacher assistants, the coaches, the folks who see your kids every single day? And keep in mind that good suicide prevention begins with good recognition. So Peter talked about the facts, feelings, actions, changes, threats, and situations. Uh, in New York, we have something called uh, suicide safety for school staff, uh, and, uh, but th there's also a program nationally called Cognito at Risk, and these are gatekeeper trainings. So one thing to, to ask yourself uh, is, are you doing this? Are your teachers aware of what are the warning signs? Do they, knew, do they know what to do and who do they go to for that warm handoff uh, so that we can get uh, those kids into your rooms uh, to help? So uh, given that, let's talk about prevention. Uh, and, uh, and I'd like to think of it in terms of that multi-tiered system of support lens, the MTSS lens. So we're gonna talk a little bit about tier one, which are kind of universal supports. That includes things like prevention, upstream prevention, talks about mental wellness education, uh, talks about really focusing on school climate, inclusiveness and connectedness. Tier two are targeted supports for those who might be more at risk. Individual risk factors like uh, being under stress, bullying, violence, and groups who might be at greater risk. We'll talk about that in a moment when we get into that, the tier two. And on the tier three, we talk about individualized intervention. What do you do for those individuals who are most at risk? And uh, those are the kids who, who, who you're, you're getting referred to. So, if we think about tier one, we think about universal considerations and rather than lecture to you, I'm gonna ask you some questions and get you thinking a little bit. So the first question is this, does your school or your school district or uh, the clinic you work on, does it have mental wellness, uh, mental health uh, you know, curriculum? 
And if so, is it a K-12 curriculum? Obviously, what you want to do with, with the uh, kindergarten kids is very different than what, what you want to do in a high school health class. And there's been a lot of uh, movement in New York State and across the country in making sure that we're, uh, that we're including mental wellness uh, and, uh, and mental health. Uh, and, and, and we're building that into the curriculum. Uh, and, and it could be anything from uh, a wellness Wednesday or a, a mindful Monday uh, to something uh, that, that's much more sophisticated. If you are using them, ask yourself, are those uh, tools research-based and are you doing anything directly for parents as well? Other tier one considerations are, and this is an important one that we'll talk about maybe a little bit later in more detail is, does your district, does your uh, school have a, a policy or a practice document in place? And if so, is it inclusive for everyone in, across the district? And does your administration and does your mental health kind of clinical staff get regular training in this? The third question when we think about kind of universal considerations is, does your frontline staff receive ongoing recognition training? Uh, that's kind of like that, uh, uh, the, the gatekeeper training we talked about. Do they know the procedures for referral and who they go to? And do they know what to do with a warm handoff? And last, is your district, is your building, are they doing enough? Are you doing enough to help foster a, a culture of inclusion, acceptance for all and connectedness? And those are questions you need to think about if, you, if we're thinking about kind of tier one, kind of universal things for all. Now, if we shift gears now to targeted intervention, just like tier two when it comes to reading might be some interventions for kids who are struggling reading. This is targeted interventions uh, for kids who uh, might be struggling more than the mainstream. Uh, so the first question is know your students and know your student population. So the first question, uh, is, is your students uh, struggling with individual concerns? Because we know that students who are struggling with things like depression, substance abuse, if they have a history of self-harm or prior, prior suicidal behavior, that if, if you know that in their history, that certainly puts them at more, more at risk than those who have not. We could also think about, in addition to some of those individual factors, there are some family factors that could increase risk. So if you know your students, do you know their home situation? Are they struggling with homelessness, poverty, violence in the home, any kind of abuse? Has there been a death of a parent? So think in terms of family risk factors that, that could uh, make things more difficult. Uh, you could also think about um, has the student been exposed to events that also increase risk? Think in terms of academic failure, disciplinary action, a relationship problem like a breakup. Are they, are they uh, uh, victims of bullying, peer rejection? Has someone else in your building made an attempt or has there been a completed suicide? Uh, one of the reasons why we like to have our administrators also be a part of our team is because uh, it's not unusual for kids who have just had a disciplinary action, let's say a suspension from school or something like that, to get really uh, depressed. And it's, so, so that, that's a particularly risky time for some. So, so we've already talked about kind of individual factors, family factors, uh, kind of uh, factors uh, based on events that are going on. And then the last is more uh, larger factors, like does the student identify with a group that's outside of the mainstream of, of of your student population. So sub-students, if, if they, if they uh, belong to a minority group, might feel very different from the mainstream. Uh, kids who are LGBTQ, uh, kids who have disabilities, those are also factors uh, because of just their group they might feel affiliation with that might also put them at risk. And that's kind of a, a tier two factor. And then the last one we're going to talk about is kind of individual interventions that you could do. And that has to do more with knowing how to assess students and how to keep them safe. Uh, so here are some other questions. Does your clinical staff receive training on risk assessment tools like the Columbia uh, Severity Rating Scale? Uh, or, uh, or are you kind of relying on more just like an interview? Um, Another question is, is, and is this part of your practice? Uh, we can talk a little bit more about the Columbia a little bit later. Uh, 
do you or do you staff ha have others who are available to create a collaborative model? I know that when I was in, uh, in my school, uh, we always tried to get two people in the room when we were assessing kids, particularly if it was a potential life and death situation. And then we always met the two of us at some point later on, we'll meet with our team and we'd process it. So that collaborative model with shared decision-making and shared responsibility is one that's really effective and takes a little bit of pressure. It's, a, it's, it's good help for the help givers. Another question to ask is, does your building have a crisis or intervention team? Are you using a collaborative approach? Are you sharing decision-making? Are you sharing responsibilities with that team? And last are, are some other things like, do you have a documentation template so you can kind of track this and, uh, and this way if kids go from school, uh, middle school to high school, that could follow them so that we have information. We don't lose that information from school to school. Do you have procedures set in place for follow-up? Are you prepared to help guide parents? We could talk about that in a little bit later. And uh, do we do any kind of safety planning intervention when it comes to students? So uh, this is my last formal slide and then we'll get into the Q&A a little bit. But here are some take-homes to think about for today. The first one is, does your district or does your building have a policy or practice document in place around suicide? And if so, it should be inclusive. The second question is, is there a focus on school climate, connectedness and inclusion uh, so that everyone, even if they're outside the mainstream, feels like they're connected and part of your, your school uh, population? The third question I would suggest is this, are all frontline staff getting that gatekeeper, gatekeeper training that Peter was talking about and the warm handoff? Another question to think about is, uh, have, uh, are we able to develop a crisis or an intervention team? And can we get them the training they need so that they have the uh, tools and the skills? Are you using evidence-based assessment tools like the Columbia scale? Uh, have you developed a reliable community mental health referral network? So do you know the, of the hospitals and the clinicians in your town? Have, do you speak to them and do you have a relationship so that there could be some collaboration if you are gonna refer out or if they're gonna see some of your students? And the last is, are you using uh, any kind of safety planning interventions, uh, which is a, uh, you know, it, it's really an evidence-based practice that we as school uh, clinicians can do in our day-to-day -day work. So, uh, John, I think at this point, we're going to switch to Q&A. Uh, if you'd like, I could stop sharing my screen. Yeah, if you could, Mitch, that, that would be great. Um, you know, first, let me thank you for that, that uh, kind of broad overview and certainly touching upon some of the, the big ideas here. I, I, I want to come back um, quite honestly, to your acknowledgement about this topic. Um, and I think that that was a very, very important acknowledgement uh, because the, the topic of suicide is difficult to talk about. And putting in the context, yes, of what we're experiencing with the pandemic, with the racial pandemic, with the war in Europe, uh, these are difficult times. And yet, um, you acknowledged it, and I want to acknowledge that when we are faced with dealing with suicide, suicidal behavior, quite honestly, it rocks the foundation of our schools. It rocks the foundation of a community. I unfortunately have experienced it in my own professional career a few times, not just once, but a few times within my, my professional community, as well as my home community uh, as well. Um, I, I, I was you know, kind of scrolling through, looking at some of the participants, and not that I want to call anyone out, but this particular colleague on, on, on the call tonight, you know, on, on the conversation tonight, who I know is experiencing this within her community uh, and, and within her professional community. She's experienced a number of losses most recently within her school community. And so while it's difficult to talk about, Mitch, we, we have to talk about it because you need to be prepared. We need to have plans in place. And, and you know, we're, we're seeing these trends. You kind of mentioned the trends. Um, what, what's up with the trends? What, what do you think is going on? Um, so some of these trends were happening pre-pandemic and the data around the pandemic is you know, still new and fresh. Uh, but 
I think if we look at that a little bit more detail, we go back and we look that 2007 date is, is kind of magical in, in the sense that, you know, things like suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, hospitalizations have ballooned for youth where, uh, you know, where homicides and suicides kind of shifted there or homicides kind of leveled off or suicides just have continued to grow in the past 15 years. And it's particularly tragic when you look at what's happened among our kind of pre-adolescent, early adolescents, that 10 to 14 year group. And uh, I don't know if you've had this experience, John, but I remember walking through an elementary school uh, in Southern Westchester. I don't know if it was on our way back from a fire drill or just on the way to lunch or something. And I'm hearing fourth and fifth graders talking about suicide. Uh, and even some of those popular shows that were out, while it depicted high school kids, it was the middle school and, and uh, pre-adolescents who a lot of times were, were watching these things and getting exposed. So our kids are getting exposed to these very sophisticated topics at a much earlier age than when my girls were in school. Um, access to smartphones and social media has been a game changer for a lot of these kids. They're under more stress than ever before. And if we think about you know, child development, uh, for a lot of these kids, that prefrontal lobe is not really fired up and acting on, you know, on all cylinders yet. And so they, they are more limited in their brain and emotional development. They're more limited in, in their emotional regulation skills. And they tend to be impulse, impulsive and they don't have the coping skills. So that's kind of a really tough combination that these kids are being exposed to very grown up scary stuff and they're really not in a position to really you know sift through it the way an adult with a fully functioning kind of executive function network uh, has it so i think that's a piece of it yeah no i really appreciate those comments mitch because i i, I think you're, you're you're hitting upon a couple of really important areas um you know and, and what i notice a, a lot in in the uh, students that i work with um you know it's it's about emotional regulation and and then struggles that, that I'm seeing that, that young people are really having difficulty with. And, and I think you're right. And hey, listen, we're, we're, we're kind of, you know, at the very beginning stages of looking at some of the data of, of what's been occurring over these past couple of years, but I'm, I'm very interested to see kind of the true impact, um, you know, of what young people have experienced. Um, but unfortunately, I think, uh, you know, part of that, that outcome is that we're gonna see more kids who are at least going to be at risk for suicidal or self-injurious behaviors um, that are out there. And John, um, if I could interrupt for a second. No, please. Uh, I, I, I know that you've experienced it in so many, Mick, I just met last week with a bunch of my Southern Westchester colleagues and uh, the pandemic uh, has, uh, things have, have ballooned. Uh, they are, uh, so, so many of my school-based colleagues are so busy just dealing with kids in crisis and uh, and you know it, it's hard to tell whether it's simply uh, the fact that the, that kids have been under greater stress or that they've been more isolated or that uh, or that they're under more emotional uh, uh, difficulties or maybe it's just that they're behind in school and feeling more isolated and hopeless uh, but I think it's even more dramatic over the past six months or year uh, uh, and I'm so thankful that there's some kind of return back to normalcy. Yeah, no, I agree. You know, it, it goes to what you were mentioning before, Mitch, in terms of risk factors. And you were kind of, you know, I really appreciate the structure of the MTSS structure of looking at our, our um, you know, prevention efforts as well as our, our response efforts. And it fits so nicely within that MTSS structure. But, but you know, we, we talk a little bit about um, those risk factors that are there. You talk about internal risk factors, kind of personal things with, within the, the uh, individual family risk factors, environmental risk factors. But, but then you mentioned uh, risk factors related to um, identification within certain groups. And this is one of those areas, quite honestly, where I, I always like to be very, very careful to um, not portray that uh, necessarily, um, uh, you know, a membership within a, a group or identification within a particular, you know, subgroup causes suicidal behavior. So could you talk just a little bit more um, about some of these groups, some of the factors that make them at a higher risk for suicidal behavior? 
Yeah, uh, uh, perfect, John. Uh, yeah, so we could talk about those individual factors, relationship factors, uh, but I think now we're focused on some groups who are at risk. And it's not causal, for sure. But one thing we do know is that being connected, being a part of a group larger than yourself, uh, having friends, being fully participatory uh, within your education and in your peer group, those are all protective factors that keep kids safe. And kids who are alienated and on the fringes of, of, of their group, uh, kids who don't identify with the mainstream, they don't have that luxury. Uh, one example that, that uh, I, I think about is uh, we've done a lot of work. Uh, I work with the uh, Suicide Prevention Center of New York State, SBCNY, and we spent this entire year really focusing on LGBTQ plus youth uh, because uh, uh, that is a particularly uh, risky group. Uh, and, and it's because they, they don't necessarily feel a part of the mainstream. Uh, they don't ha necessarily have the same uh, you know, uh, uh, people to connect with. And so the research shows that in, uh, for that group, they're almost four times more likely to have suicidal thoughts and suicidal behavior. Uh, that's why when we talk about having a policy, we have to make sure that it's inclusive and why going back to tier one, it's so important to make sure that your building is welcoming and inclusive for all. A uh, great resource for that is uh, the Trevor Project, you mentioned them before, and Trevor Lifeline, which is, which is a, uh, a call-in line specifically for that community. Yeah, you know, I, I appreciate you mentioning uh, the Trevor Project. I mean, they do some amazing, amazing work within the uh, LGBTQ uh, community. And, and again, I think it's important for us to, um, you know, again, mention that it's not necessarily individuals who identify uh, themselves within that community, but the, the risk factors are more what they need to deal with in terms of society and environmental factors, um, and, and, and at times the rejection that, that they experience, um, and, the, and the disconnect, you were talking about that connection with a larger whole um, is, is a protective factor, and sometimes- Not, not having your niche, and not being uh, connected, when, and, and that's for any group that feels on the fringe of the mainstream. Uh, you know, it, it just, it puts you at greater risk for sure. Yeah, no, no, I, I appreciate that. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I know in my practice uh, and, and really uh, uh, thinking about this is, um, you know, policies and professional practices often guide a lot of this within the school districts. And you kind of mentioned that as one of the takeaways, as one of the, the, the critical factors, you know, do we have um, you know, that um, uh, present within our schools. So I'm wondering if you could talk just a little about, um, you know, how do we establish policies? How do we establish these professional practices within a school district? Yeah, I, I think that's one that goes back to tier one and thinking in terms of uh, making sure that, that the, the district is really thinking about this in advance. So one, one important question I asked before is whether your district, your school, uh, your agency, whether they have a policy or a practice document in place, which kind of drives what we're doing. Uh, our partners at Trevor actually have also been, and you know this, John, have been working on legislation in a lot of the states to make that law. I know they were successful in doing it in California. Uh, they're working uh, on, on getting something like that passed, and that would make a, a requirement. I know in New York, our state education department is now, uh, while there's no law in place, they're really pushing to make sure that uh, that that this is part of everyone's practice. And I think it begins by making sure that every school district, every building has either a, a school board policy or at least a practice document in place for everyone in, in your district or your building to follow. And, and it should have, uh, and that's gonna talk about kind of best practice and make sure that we're all doing things in the same way and kind of all rowing in the same direction. And a good policy We'll have things like the gatekeeper training we talked about, uh, making sure we're developing a team, making sure your team is getting training, uh, making sure that there's uh, you know, thoughts of what we could do for students and for parents. Uh, and I know that um, I know that uh, you know some of the uh, practices that you know that that Trevor is pushing is is also to make sure that that's that's inclusive for everyone. Uh, so. Um, 
So absence of the law, I think it's important for us to ask that question. Is there a policy in place? It isn't an effective one. I know that uh, some districts say they have a policy, but when you look at it carefully, it essentially says suicide is bad, don't do it. And, and as opposed to what are the nuts and bolts step that you and your team need to have in place to make sure that there's effective practice going on. So yeah, it does have to start from the top down. So I implore those of you who are administrators uh, or those of you who are school-based uh, clinical staff to go back to your administrators and to talk about that and, and, and to really push to try to get something in place so that, so that it's really what we're doing is clear and that it's uh, kind of following best practice. You know, and one thing that helped us uh, within my own district is we connected it to our, our crisis planning. Um, uh, and, and so crisis planning, um, as we know, it's, it's all about that preparedness um, and, and the sense of, um, you know, what were the policies and practices. Uh, and so suicide, suicidal behavior, risk assessments are part of that crisis planning. Um, yep. And so that was a, a kind of a natural fit um, I know that that we were able to do, and I, I know a lot of districts are trying to to kind of incorporate it within that area. Any thoughts on on that, Mitch? Uh, you know, in terms of crisis planning, crisis preparedness. Yeah, it could it could be in in one and the same as a group. The only thing I would caution is we want to try to veer suicide away from some of the school violence, school shooting things, and although. Practice for assessing kids who may be at risk to others is not so different than some of the uh, uh, interventions that we do. But uh, so it can be part of the crisis team, but it should be seen as very different from some of the violence prevention that we're doing. And the fact of the matter is, you're much more likely uh, in, in your home school district to be dealing with a suicidal kid than you will a school shooter. So it's, it's probably, uh, uh, I can't say it's more important, but they're both equally important to, to do. So yeah, part of the crisis team, but I think it has to be different than some of the stuff around violence. No, and that's an excellent point. In fact, one of the distinctions that we made was, um, you know, doing risk assessments for, for targeted violence is very different than doing risk assessments for self-harm. Um, so I think it, that's a great point to make, Mitch. 100%. And, yeah. and, and in the same way that we certainly don't want police intervening with someone who may be suicidal, where if someone has a weapon, we probably want police help. So let's talk just a little bit about those, those risk assessments. You, you had mentioned before using um, evidence-based tools. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of wondering if you could talk just a little bit about, you know, what should we be using when we're engaged in those risk assessments with potentially, uh, uh, you know, students who are considering self-harm? Well, there's, there's more than one out there, but, uh, but uh, we do a training called uh, it's a clinician training called Helping Students at Risk for Suicide. Uh, it was developed with NIAS, the New York Association of School Psychologists, and SBCNY. Uh, we developed it about five years ago, and we train exclusively with the Columbia scale. It's the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, CSSRS. And we like the Columbia scale. It's not the only game in town, but we like it because it's free. It's available in the public domain. All you have to do is go, uh, if you Google Columbia Lighthouse Project, you can access it very easily that way. And you can download a copy today, literally. It's available in 114 country specific languages. And there are forms for different providers. So school sites might have a different form than school nurses. Uh, and there's also kind of like a short term screener and there's kind of a more longer longer one you know where, where you ask many more questions dig more into like ideation and we love it because it's very well researched and uh i know that uh, you know maddie gould she's a wonderful uh, epidemiologist at a columbia university she's done a lot of research uh on the topic and uh and uh her research suggests that using the columbia scale along as part of your clinical interview with the kids in school is much more effective than just relying on your clinical interview alone because uh, it just it really gets you to ask all the right questions so um but something to, to think about though because i know this comes up sometimes when we do our trainings and we first develop this program 
the Columbia scale and that helping students at risk for suicide training that we do, that's about triage assessment, John. That's about uh, determining a student's level of risk, which is gonna inform us as to what to do. If someone's at high eminent risk, we're probably gonna to wanna to do something differently than if they're at some risk, but they have a, a clinician they work with. Uh, so, uh, so when we talk about pathway to care, uh, you know, part of what we do will depend on their level of risk. And what I like about the Columbia is if they answer these questions, yes, but these others, no, then that puts them in like a lower risk category. This still means they may be at risk for suicidal behavior, but we're probably not going to ship them off in an ambulance to the ER. Uh, so, um, uh, so uh, as we think about that, so, and that's very different from what happens at the hospital. Uh, when they go to the hospital, the assessment's more in depth and, and it's really about diagnosis and treatment planning. Uh, so we're not asking school psychologists to do what happens at a psychiatric ER. Uh, we're not asking school social workers, school counselors to do that. But the Columbia is something that, uh, that you could use, that school nurses can use uh, with the right training uh, to, to determine a level of risk and to kind of influence how you respond to, to the interview. So I, I really want to pause on that point for a moment, Mitch, because I, I think that that's really important for school-based uh, mental health professionals, administrators, teachers who may be listening in on this to, to really understand and understand the distinction of what we're saying here. We're not asking, um, you know, uh, a school psychologists or, or social workers or administrators to be making uh, the ultimate determination on the safety we're asking our colleagues who are working in the schools to know warning signs, to certainly know behaviors that, that may be there. And one of the instruments that, that you're talking about, the Columbia uh, Suicide Severity Scale, is one that is standardizes that kind of interview, standardizes that risk assessment. Right, uh, it's and a semi structured interview, right. Correct. Um, and then depending upon how a student responds based upon that interview, then there are different pathways to go once, a, uh, once you finish that interview. Exactly. Because again, uh, uh, we're not expected to do what's happening in a psychiatric hospital, but uh, doing the Columbia gives us a, a ballpark of, of where the kids are at and it's more effective than just the interview, and it helps drive kind of recommendations. And, and that's what we want. We wanna know what do we need to do uh, to keep kids safe, short of kind of sending them off to the hospital, which we already talked about, that's not the most effective pathway of, to care sometimes. Okay, all right. I wanna shift just a minute because, um, you know, when I, when I do work with my teacher colleagues, this is scary stuff. Um, and, um, you know, oftentimes I, I have colleagues who come to me and say, John, I don't want to be in a position to be making these big decisions, uh, you know, about, about a child's life. Um, but, but you mentioned gatekeeper training before we, we, we talked a little about this warm handoff. Um, let's dive into that just a little bit more for our, our guests tonight, um, you know, what are we really talking about, Mitch? First, to, uh, you know, for those that may not be familiar with warm handoff, can, can you kind of just tell what, what a warm handoff is? It's kind of a funny term. Um, and, and we give Peter Faustino a hard time about it all the time because of his video. But, you know, it's a real thing. A warm handoff is a real thing. So what are we really asking our teacher uh, colleagues to do here? Yeah, so they don't have to know that there's a problem. But listen, our English teachers see the kids writing uh, every day and they notice changes. The art teacher sees their artwork. I mean, our teachers, our coaches, our teacher aides, our, our assistants, they are our eyes and ears. They see the kids every day. They notice the changes. And if they have concerns, uh, all they need to do, they don't need to be certain. All they need to do is kind of talk to the kids, get a sense of them, bring you know bring the kids to us or bring the information to us and we'll pull the kids in uh and and then from there that's what the warm handoff is it's like i'm you know it's you know what i'm concerned about you uh johnny uh you you seem uh depressed these days your writing has become pretty morose 
I want to bring you down to uh, Dr. Kelly. He's really good to talk to. And I want to see if he has some ideas on how to best help you. Come with me. Let's walk down to the guidance office. That's so, the warm hand. So we're asking our teacher colleagues just to recognize changes, some of those facts that 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 you know Peter talked about, that you talked about, um, you know, using that acronym that are that are in there. Um, and if they're concerned how to get that child connected with the appropriate support. That's the warm handoff, right? Exactly. And so we don't we don't expect teachers to diagnose these kids or know anything. We just want, if they notice changes, if, if one or two of their behaviors start checking those boxes that they remember, oh yeah, we did that training a year ago. Aha, yeah. Uh, then, you know, bring them to Dr. Kelly, let Dr. Kelly kind of uh, meet and uh, talk to the student uh, just to determine if, if they're okay or not. And that's okay. the one. Excellent, excellent. So Mitch, you and I know that um, school shouldn't have to do this alone. Um, that that we're, we're not in it alone and we need to have those partners. You, you had talked about, I, I think, uh, kind of a mental health network. Um, I often think about um, what I call resource mapping. Um, you know, identifying different sources of support. Can you talk a little bit more about that, kind of share some insights in terms of that mental health network? Yeah, of course. And I want to talk about it in two ways. One is, you mentioned before how scary it is to do this work. And so one of the things I did early on uh, when I developed this and instead of using it back in the schools was uh, I always tried to get a second clinical member of my team in. So if the student was referred to me, I would typically grab the student's guidance counselor, bring them in. They were also trained in the Columbia and we would uh, kind of make a determination of risk together. Not everyone has that luxury. Uh, sometimes we're the only clinician for miles, uh, but there are also ways around that, like the school nurse, most buildings have a school nurse or uh, a, a really, uh, inspiring teacher or an administrator who works well with the kids, they can get that training. So, so in that way, you know, one of the things that we want to talk about is if you can maybe not be in the position of having to make those life and death decisions alone. Second is we always followed up later that day or the next morning with our entire team. Uh, and we would process it out, uh, both kind of brainstorming what went right, what went wrong, but also kind of determine what else did we need to do to follow up so that we felt like we were not alone in the room and we were not alone and that we had everyone, including our administration, sitting around that table, uh, uh, helping us kind of make decisions about what to do. Should we follow up and do this? I'll take care of that. Why don't you call a parent? I'll follow up. So one thing is to think about the network you have in your building. The second one is making sure that uh, that uh, before the crisis occurs, before a tragedy occurs, that you've already worked hard to develop a great network of people in your community. Uh, so it's important to have a relationship with community mental health. If there's a youth officer in town, if there's community mental health, uh, if there's mobile crisis, and it's also important to have a relationship with some of the psychiatrists and, and some of the clinicians in your neighborhood. So you know them in advance. So if, if, if those, uh, those uh, folks are working with your kids, you could have a free exchange of information as long as you have that release. Um, and, and so building those partnerships in advance really helps things go. In our training, we also talk about if you're doing an intervention, get a release so you can talk to mental health. So you can give them uh, you know, the facts and, and your Columbia results so they can get back to you and let you know, you know what they've determined and what, they, what their recommendation is. But there's a diagnosis, medication, hospitalization. So that doesn't happen in a vacuum. I think that only happens when you have a relationship when they know you and you know them. Uh, so one other thing to think about is make sure if you haven't done this to really work on strengthening those relationships. Yeah, you know, and, and I do want to acknowledge this because I, I want to be very real with 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 our our you know audience today that I, I want to acknowledge that in some areas of the country, um, you know, particularly rural areas, you don't have that network, you don't have that. Uh, you know, vast array of community resources. And, and so, you know, this is where the concept of, of uh, resource mapping comes into play when we're doing our planning. We don't want to be searching for the resources when we need them. Um, and so that planning becomes very, very important, particularly if there's a dearth of, 
of available resources, you know, within your community um, that's out there. Um, you know, Mitch, our, our hour, I mean, this, this flew by, uh, it's quickly coming to a close, but I do want to, um, you know, get to some of the audience questions, but I'm wondering if you could briefly talk just a little bit about, um, you know, what I call re-entry planning or, or uh, safety planning for, for students that may be at risk. And, and so, you know, when, when we identify a student um, that, that may be at risk, what type of safety planning? And then if we send a student out for an evaluation, what type of re-entry planning should we be considering? Yeah, so when we do at that Helping Students at Risk workshop, we, we frame it in terms of safety for now and then safety, safety for later. For, so safety for now really has to do with, with using uh, a safety plan. Uh, Stanley Brown, Barbara Stanley at Columbia University developed this. It's available in the public domain. Uh, and there are both paper versions and also apps uh, for safety planning. And it's a, an effective tool that uh, any school-based mental health professional can use. And it's based on cognitive behavior therapy. It's evidence-based. So you can uh, take a safety plan and do evidence-based practice therapy right in the building. Uh, so, and, and essentially, I, I won't go into detail, but essentially it, uh, one of the things that you can do with the student, even while you're waiting for uh, their parent to come back or upon their reentry, is to help them develop a safety plan identifying triggers, coming up with individuals that could help them, uh, 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 things they could do on their own for help. Uh, what kind of help seeking behavior can they do? Who in the building can they go to for help? What professionals can they go to for help? Can you provide them with, um, you know, with, with important numbers like the crisis text line? Oh, by the way, 988. Uh, starting in September, uh, that 988, uh, you know, is, is going to be kind of like the shortcut to the suicide uh, crisis helpline. Uh, that's going to go into effect, I think, uh, you know, over the summer or certainly by September. Uh, they're working the details out for that. Uh, so that's all about safety for now. And then you also have to think about in your planning what you're going to do uh, with students when they return to school. Uh, number one, uh, you know, uh, can you get a, you know, who's going to follow up and talk to the parents? Who's going to see the kid upon their return? Is there anyone who can reach out to community mental health and find out what changes? Is there a diagnosis, a treatment plan? Is the child on medication? Was there any kind of injury if they made an attempt? Uh, and, and in addition, you want to work with the child to make sure that you update the safety plan, uh, that you, um, uh, that they know kind of what to do. If the kids have missed a substantial amount of school, there needs to be some thinking about what do you do about the missed work so it doesn't affect their grades. The kids have to know if kids are asking questions, what do they say? Uh, what, what should the teachers be told and what should be kept confidential? Uh, getting back to the person who made you that warm hand up. Those are all things to think about as part of that safety for later kind of yeah, you, you know, as I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, you know, about all of these these different steps, I'm, I'm going to have one ask for you at, at, at the end of this, because I, I want to come bring George back in in just a minute to see if we have any audience questions or any issues to address there. Um, I'm, I have one ask for you. Would you put together a resource list that we could send out to our audience um, and those that may be watching this on demand? Uh, because you have filled us with so many different thoughts, ideas, scales, um, you know, strategies. Would you put together a list for us? Uh, actually, it's already done. So I'll, I'll show you this. Uh, it's, it's a book that we developed uh, with our Suicide Prevention Center. It's called The Guide uh, for Suicide Prevention in New York Schools. What's great about this is uh, it's available on our New York Association of School Psychologists website. It's also available on the SPCNY website and it's free. And it even works better as a um, ebook than it does a paper version. I happen to have a paper version I have. So you go in there and you click links and it's got amazing resources in there. Uh, uh, for school leaders, resources, online resources for parents, printable uh, resources uh, for educators. Uh, so it's filled with lots of great stuff and it's in the public domain. It's free to anyone uh, who, who wants to access that. And it's we called love, a, guide, a guide. We love free, we love free uh, resources. Well, we'll make sure we get that link up there. 
If I, if I may interject, uh, Mitch, I'd love to be able to direct our attendees as to where they can go to follow you, to learn more about you, and where we might get this resource as well. I can drop those things into the chat if you just, or if you want to drop them into the chat as well. Um, normally, there's a slide that has all this information, but I've noticed that this in, in this presentation, there, there was- There it is. Uh, Dr. Faustino was uh, listening in. Uh, he should have come up for his cameo. So there it is, preventsuicide.org. That's SBCNY or John, the NIAS website? Uh, NIASP.org, NYASP.org. So it's under the resource there, section. Look, look up the guide and it's all in there for you and you're, you're welcome to have it. It does focus a little bit more on New York. Uh, AFSP, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention is also an amazing resource. Trevor Foundation has amazing resources for their community. If you have a large Latin population, uh, uh, life is precious. Uh, communal life uh, is a great resource, and they're all in here. But those those are some great resources for you to for you to have, and they're all very hands on and, and user friendly. So let's see if we can address anything. Maybe we haven't talked about George that may have come up in in our chat. Yes, uh, we've got a handful of questions and comments here. I don't know that we'll have time to address all of them, but let's start with a question asked by Betsy Jane Bash. Can you talk about specifically about suicide assessment for the little ones, 10 and under? In our experience, our schools struggle significantly with trying to tease out the assessment needs for this special population. Yeah, and, and it's, a, it's a really good question. Uh, when we do our helping students at risk clinician training, we do talk in a little bit more detail about that because while you're going through those six Columbia questions, getting to ideation and behavior, you're gonna ask the questions differently for a young population than you would for an older one. And in the same way, uh, you know, Gary Schaefer, John, uh, Gary works with the uh, OPWDD population and, and you're gonna ask, uh, you're gonna use a different set of questions and language when you're trying to assess a student who might be more limited cognitively as well. So you can go back and uh, what I like about the Columbia is that it, it gives you the questions, but it doesn't make you ask it in one particular way. So with young kids, you might not want to say, do you wish you were dead? It might be something more like, have you ever thought about not wanting to live or going to sleep forever? something like that. So you can change the language to work with your population. Uh, so um, that's why I like the fact that it's semi-structured. So you can you know, do the interview as yourself, but you, you make sure that you ask a form of those six key questions that are on the Columbia. Awesome. We've got a couple more time for a couple more questions. I know we're at time, but I don't mind going over, John. If you don't, I want to be respectful of all of you. No, okay. with, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, hit up upon uh, a few more. Okay, we've got a question from, from Renee Fetchcan. Please guide us specifically toward best tools and protocols for suicide assessment and interviews. The tool for questioning and decision-making are critical. You mentioned the Columbia screening tool, but I'm hoping for options to craft a solid best practice sequence to analyze risk. Right. So the Columbia is, is the one that we like best for all the reasons I said, it's really well researched. And then that helping students at risk training is great training for clinicians because it walks you through everything from understanding a little bit about uh, kind of the, the philosophy and, and the theory behind suicide uh, prevention. Uh, it talks about, uh, you know, all that gatekeeper training. You get practice on the Columbia. You also get practice using safety planning. Uh, and that safety planning app. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention. So there's a couple of good apps since a lot of times kids don't have their phone. Uh, they have their phones. Uh, you know, I like using a safety planning app for those kids who have phones. One like the My3 app or the Stanley Brown safety planning app. Uh, so uh, so uh, and, and uh, in our uh, guide, it talks about all of those things, things that you can do for tier one, for two, tier two, for tier three. It even touches on postvention uh, so that your school's prepared if you do have a tragic death. And just to uh, respond a little bit additionally to that question, um, I would point to the guide that Mitch is, is referencing and that uh, uh, Dr. Faustino put up the link to, because within that guide, there are references to different uh, um, screening uh, tools, things of that nature. 
So if, if you're looking for something beyond the Columbia, uh, something you know uh, maybe a little bit different for your district, uh, that guide will help you identify some of those tools. So we, we have one, and it appears to be a very short question from Dr. Corey Wilson. Can you please post the name of that scale? I think someone posted it in the okay. um, in the chat box oh, already. Oh, the Columbia severity rating. Okay, there it is. Yeah. So um, yeah. And if you just go on to Columbia Lighthouse Project, uh, it's right there. It's the CSSRS. Fantastic. Well, I think that takes us to time. I know you've got a couple of announcements for us, John. So I do. I, do. I, I, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Mitchell Samet, uh, you know, good friend again uh, for all of the information around a very, very difficult topic. Uh, but we do have upcoming uh, conversations. Uh, another good friend of mine, Dr. Jack Naglieri, will be coming in next week. Um, and, and I'm excited for Dr. Naglieri to come in. We, we know him and then those you know, within the school psychology community, within education, know him in terms of the assessments. But what I really appreciate uh, kind of the direction that Dr. Naglieri, within the last, I'm going to say, 10 years or so, has really ventured into equity um, and, and access to uh, programs for all students. And what we know about the research as it relates to gifted education is that unfortunately there's a disproportionate number of, of, of uh, students of color that unfortunately aren't given access to this enhanced uh, type of programming. Um, and so next week, I'm gonna to talk to Dr. Naglieri a little bit more about that. And then the following week, I'm excited to bring in Dr. Uh, Kelly Valancourt. Um, uh, Dr. Valancourt um, has done a lot of work at the national level. Um, she has been a, a spearheading work around how we take care of ourselves, how we take care of our students, particularly during these difficult times, these challenging times that we've all recognized. So uh, looking forward to Dr. Naglieri next week and Dr. Valancourt the following week. Please come back and join me for Office Hours with Dr. John Kelly. I want to thank you for being here tonight. Have yes, a great evening. Yeah. Would love to remind everyone we will be sending a link to the recorded presentation as well as a copy of the deck. Um, if you like today's presentation, like we said in the beginning, please follow us on Twitter at Aluma Solutions. And uh, we look forward to seeing all you next week. Have a great evening. Thank you, George. Great job, Mitch. <laughs>